All right, you see right here? Let's start uh, with the first question. Uh, which of the following best describes the low side of a system? Low pressure and low temperature, low pressure and high temperature, high pressure and high temperature, or high pressure and low temperature? Low pressure. Low pressure and low temperature. Temperature and pressure, when you're talking about refrigerant, are going to be uh, going together. As a matter of fact, if you look at your refrigerant gauges, and I need really to take one of those and hold them for you. <coughs> These are refrigerant gauges right here. That's the 134. And these refrigerant gauges, if you look at the, if you look at the, the little numbers and all, you'll see that temperature and pressure are actually listed on the gauges. Look at them gauges. Look at them really close. And you can see that you've got temperature and pressure both listed on the gauges. See what I mean? It's all about that. And you know, pass it to them other guys, and y'all play them over on the bench when you're done. Uh, but. Okay, uh, which of the following best describes the high side of the system, high pressure and high temperature? That's another A. So that's A and A. Uh, you might notice the red gauge is for high temperature. The low gauge is for low temperature. Uh, so your blue, and those, those fittings will only hook up one way. You've all hooked up AC equipment, and you know how to do that, right? Okay, now when I'm going to check my refrigerant, to see what's in it. In other words, if I want to see if there's hydrocarbon or if I want to see if it's a blend or whatever, which side of the system to hook up to the low side or the high side? Uh, high side. Mm. You can hook up to the high side. Oh, do you want liquid in my refrigerant machine? Well, you don't really have to think about it a whole lot because it won't fit but one fitting. Got it? All right. Now, let me let me whip through this right quick because this is, going, this is important. Okay. This right here is a compressor. This right here is the evaporator. This right here is a condenser. I'm just drawing this to be real simple, right? <laughs> See that? Okay, so this right here, let's say that this is a fixed orifice system. It's a fixed orifice system. Why do we call that a fixed orifice? Instead of having an expansion valve on it, it's going to have an orifice tube. The orifice tube is a little plastic thing about this big. It looks like a screen, and I could have one of those in my hand if I'd have been, you know, thought clearly enough to do it. But what are we going to do here? That leaving our compressor, where are we going? Which direction is the refrigerant moving? You're going to have to do this on your final exam, okay? So you better be paying attention. Don't get, don't have this bored look about. I'll be so glad when we're through in here, so I can go out in the shop and finish working on my Dodge. You know what I'm saying? No. No. Oh, you don't want to work on the Dodge, do you? Oh, you do want to work on the Dodge. Okay. All right. So. All right, so which way is this going? Okay, you might notice also there's a fan in both places, right? Both places? There's a fan here and there's a fan there. Think about it. you got a condenser fan you got a fan blowing into the car. Oh, yeah. Duh. All right, so both these are heat exchangers. It's a heat exchanger, that's a heat exchanger. Which way is it going? Leaving the compressor going where? condenser. Okay, what do we call this line? What do we call this line? Now there's three different size lines. You got a big fat line, you got a medium sized line, and you got a real skinny line. <clears throat> Alright. Anybody remember what that line's called? I went over this first day of class, right? Okay, we'll talk about that again in a minute. Okay, now I'm gonna leave this one and go where? I'm leaving a condenser going where? Huh? What does that call? Alright. But I am going through an orifice tube. No, well, this one right here, I want to say this has got a fixed orifice, right? Mm -hmm. But we are going through an orifice tube, but it's not going through a dryer on the high side. This line right here is the little bitty line, the little the liquid line, they call it. However, when it gets past this little orifice, this right here is, what what state is the refrigerant in when it leaves here? It's a gas. It's a high-pressure gas. That line's going to be a hot one, isn't it? Right here, we're basically got a gas that's doing what? It's condensing. That means it's turning into a liquid. As it turns into a liquid, it's giving away heat, getting rid of heat. When it leaves here, it's a high-pressure liquid. Okay, and usually, I mean, a lot of these cars nowadays, you'll have a high-pressure switch to open, either kick on the condenser fan a little higher or whatever. All right, now, coming up here, 
we got going through our orifice. We're going to turn into, we're changing states on our refrigerant. What are we changing the states to? What is it? Gas. No, not a gas yet. It's changing to a low pressure liquid. It has to be liquid when it goes in there. Okay. Why does it have to be liquid when it goes in there? Because what happens in here? It's cold. Huh? When it gets cold. It evaporates. So it cannot evaporate in here unless it's already, unless it's a liquid when it goes in there. Now you can't actually have clear lines where you can see all this kind of stuff, but basically you're choking it right here like you're putting your finger over the end of a water hose and it's pss, misting out. So it's basically a low pressure liquid with a lot of exp ability to expand. As it expands and begins to turn, and what's the boiling point of refrigerant? Remember? 21 below zero, basically. You're talking about 21 below zero, it boils. Oh, yeah. You remember that stuff I had in that little uh, uh, that little uh, can of uh, duster? Yeah. And you spray it in there when I poured it on the table, it boiled like you poured it water on a hot skillet. That's what it is. Okay, coming out of here, we got a big line. Now remember, this is a fixed orifice system, right? Fixed orifice. I'm going to get the better markers. These markers here. I got, where's my markers at? I, need some, I got some markers in there. That's a crummy, crummy... Well, all these markers are wore out. That's a fixed orifice system. Coming out of here, what do we got? Yes. But it goes through an accumulator. It's low pressure, and it goes back to there. So this is a compressor. This is the condenser. This is the evaporator. This is the orifice. And that is the accumulator. Now, what do you remember about the accumulator? If I don't burn this in, you know, if I explain it one time and you sit there and say, yeah, that's really interesting, and you move on and I don't ever talk about it again, you just totally just evaporates. You don't want to think about it anymore. That's why we're going over it again. And what happens in, the, in this uh, accumulator? This is that big silver can. Uh, and that when it mixes with the refrigerator? I mean, not with the refrigerant, with the... With the oil. It picks up some oil in there. Now, in that thing, we got a tube. This tube is actually coming in, going down, and whenever this compressor is pulling refrigerant out of that, it can't get anything but vapor. But it also gets a little bit of oil mixed with it in the process because there's some oil in there. And I can show you a cutaway of that later. But the fact is, you got low-pressure gas in here, and this needs to be cold all the way to here. If somebody says, my air conditioner's not working, and you just walk up there before you even hook your gauges up, and the compressor's running, but this is not cold. See, if the compressor's running all the time, what do we know? Now, you know how you got low pressure, and this right in here in this line right here, usually on this thing right here, you're going to have a low-pressure cutout switch. And it's got two wires going to it. And that low pressure cutout switch that's in this low side line is going to cause that compressor to cycle off and on if it gets low on refrigerant or if the pressure gets below a certain level, turn off that heat because it's too hot in here. All right, so up here we got a high pressure cutout. It's got the ability to cut off the compressor and also is going to probably kick the condenser fan on high. Got that? So if this pressure goes up too high, it's going to kill the compressor and kick the condenser fan on high. And if this, pressure, this switch up here, if the pressure gets too low, it's going to kill the uh, compressor too. So that's why your compressor short cycles is because this silly little thing up here is causing that. See? This little switch is in the low side up here. So you've got a contact switch up here and you got one down here. Now on some of your really complicated newer ones, you've got a transducer here, which means it's got reference voltage going to it and your computer knows exactly what that high side pressure is. What are you smiling about? <laughs> you didn't have your phone in your hand. You're smiling about something. Oh, uh, I just I got to keep an eye on Brandon. I don't want him to sneak around. Look at him. He's smiling again. What's he laughing about? He's now he's laughing. What's funny, Brandon? Okay. All right. Now then, see this. We got so we have this. Now this is a fixed orifice system. Okay. Now what I'm going to do? That, that you guys, I'm telling you ahead of time. One of the things that's going to be on your file. You'll have a question on there, or you're going to have to do it on the board for the class, is on the, your verbal exam or something like that. You're going to have to go through this stuff, and you're going to have to explain to me what's in each one of these lines. What's it? This is the discharge line. Can you remember the discharge line from the compressor to the condenser? From that's the liquid line, and this line right here is the suction line. All right. Now sometimes your high pressure tap that you're going to put your you know hook your gauges up to. It's going to be on the discharge line, and sometimes it'll be on the liquid line. It just depends on how they decide to do it. 
All right. You might even notice that on the GMC, the low side and the high side fittings are on the same doggone pipe. But the orifice is between them. Is that interesting? All right. Now then, uh, let's do this again with, we got the same line. I'm not going to change anything here. This is the same pretty much. Uh, this line right here is going to be the same, except you've got an expansion valve. And that expansion valve is fixed so that the suction line, it actually, the expansion valve is measuring the temperature of the suction line so it will know how to change the size of the orifice. You got it? Brendan, what are you doing? Who are you talking I'm to? Leave, so. Yeah. What you need to, <laughs> yeah, who, whoever you're texting, you need to say, don't text me right now, I'm in class, okay? So you need to send a text about that. Say, the instructor just fussed at me because I'm texting in class, so I need to get off the phone. You know, wait till you get in the bathroom or something like that to text them back. All right, now then. So right here, we're going to take this out. We're going to take it out right there. All right. See that? And that's the suction line, which is actually going to be the... the this. Notice how this Chrysler was really slick. They run the suction line through here, and they got the fixed orifice in here. Some of them have got this little uh, alcohol diaphragm here with a little... Sensing tube coming off of it that's taped to this nerve thing. Taped to it? Yeah, it's actually got some uh, that uh, sticky. No, no, no. It's some sticky press tape stuff that's made for air conditioning. And it actually, you put that around there. And it's measuring that. And that's to make, letting the orifice decide. And there'll be a little screen in that orifice sometime that will stop up and keep him from working. And somebody can take it out and you can clean it. Or you're really supposed to replace it. Now, remember what I told you if your low side and your high side are both low and it's not cooling? And typically, the expansion valve is what's wrong with it. That's usually what it is. If your low side and your high side are both low and it's not cooling, sometimes the evaporator will cause that, that condition, but typically it'll be an expansion valve issue. All right, now we don't have an orifice here, but we do have, we do have, uh, well, we got an orifice, but it's not fixed. It's actually a changing orifice based on the temperature of that. The, that one there, the difference in that one is you don't have this accumulator here, but you've got a dryer over here. So the dryer's over here on the ones with an expansion. Here. And I'll tell you what's funny about that. I've talked to people that work on air conditioners all the time. You know, some of these mechanics, they work on air conditioners every day. They fix air conditioners all day, every day. I said, have you ever noticed that if a vehicle's got an expansion valve, it'll have the little receiver dryer over here in the liquid line, and if it's got, if it's got a fixed orifice, it will have a big accumulator over here. And they'll say, I never thought of that. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, they instantly run it through what they know to be the truth, you know. Now, when somebody tells you something that you've never heard before, what's the first thing your mind does? Your mind compares it to what you know to be the truth to see if it lines up, right? Mm -hmm. What if you don't have any data to compare it with? You just pretty much got to accept it. So when you're in school, if somebody tells you something, you don't have anything to build on, that may be your foundational material. That's what we're doing here is we're giving you a foundation so you can understand refrigerator flow. Let me tell you something. You guys, and I may make you do this in class one day, explain this to each other and go over it together. Talk to somebody about it. You know what I'm saying? Chelsea, explain it to your boyfriend. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? Get him where you Sit him down with a piece of paper yeah. and draw okay, this out. I can see that going down. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever will listen to you. Anybody. It doesn't have to be him. Anybody that will listen to you so you're going to talk to them. All right, now let's go through the rest of these. I always have to do this because sometimes we just get so into the blowing through the test and jumping out into the shop that we don't learn some of the stuff we have to learn. And we've been... I'm figuring that most of our air conditioning learning is going to happen toward the end of the semester when it gets warmer because that's when people start squawking about their air conditioners and we're going to wind up having to do more air conditioner work toward the end of the semester. <laughs> right now we're loaded with engine and transmission work, aren't we? Okay, bingo. All right. Um, in a properly operating system, the evaporator temperature is about what? In a properly operating system, the evaporator temperature is about what? It's going to be uh, just above freezing. Just above freezing. You don't want it to go below freezing. You don't want it to freeze up. So I, Did you know that on Volkswagen, they have uh, temperature sensors in the register coming out into the car so they can tell what it is? Let me ask you this. Did you know that uh, in the uh, that Hyundai out there, they're the little the water that's in the evaporator, you know, that in there, they actually have a temperature sensor measuring that on that air conditioning system. they got a temperature sensor in there. Okay, the uh, the thermal expansion valve is located where? At the condenser inlet, the evaporator outlet, the condenser outlet, the evaporator inlet. That's the 
expansion valve right over there, right? Yeah, that's right. It's at, at the evaporator inlet. Yeah. Before the refrigerant goes in there, did you turn that? Did you turn that off? When's it still blowing? <laughs> it's blowing. It's still blowing. It's still blowing. I should not be. I should not be hearing that fan. Okay. Okay. Today's Brandon's turn to be for me to give him a hard time. Either. Anyway. <laughs> I love to get one of those looks out of him. Okay. Now then, so the refrigerant inside of evaporators call is is what? What is it? Is it a liquid? Liquid change into a gas? Gas or gas change into a liquid? It's a gas. It's a liquid. Ga- no, that's the condenser shoe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we got liquid change into a gas, and that's when it evaporates. Oh. When it's evaporating, <laughs> it's in the evaporator, right? Yeah. Uh, an accumulator is very similar to a what? A rece- evaporator, receiver, dryer, orifice tube, or condenser. We already talked about that just a minute ago, huh? No, when no, I accumulator. The accumulator's on the other side of the evaporator, right? Yeah, the accumulator, yeah. The accumulator, if you've got an orifice tube, you're going to have an accumulator. Remember that. What I said, if you've got a... Uh, huh? Well, that's a phone ringing. Well, let me answer the phone right quick and see what they got for me here. If I can stop. Okay, and now that the phone call is passed... Um, two technicians are discussing orifice tubes. Technician A says orifice tubes usually placed close to the evaporator inlet. Is that right? Mm-hmm. He's right. Technician B says orifice tube is placed close to the condenser in some vehicles. Is he right? Mm-hmm. Yes, he is too. You know which vehicles it is? Like an early 90s Chevrolet. You got to pull the doggone grill and the liquid line where it comes out of the condenser. That orifice is right there. It ain't that far from the condenser. And you. What's number six? You never told us. Did I miss number six? Yeah. An accumulator is similar to a receiver dryer. I'd already answered that question with my little diagram all ago. You can figure that out. Yeah, yeah. Come on. All right. All right. Now then, um, let me see. Uh, two technician. Oh, excuse me. Number seven is basically going to be a C. It is placed close to the condenser in some vehicles, believe it or not. Two technicians are discussing AC problem. Technician A says an overcharge of refrigerant will cause a higher than normal high side pressure. Technician B says a refrigerant will call overcharge will cause poor cooling. Right, both of those guys are right too. Think about what you're going to do now. If you're checking a vehicle that the air conditioner is not cooling on, the first thing you want to know is the compressor running. And I'll tell you a quick little funny story here. Uh, Jerry Littlefield was a guy that was in here one of the first semesters I taught. And he says, or maybe in the second semester I taught, and we had this Buick Riviera came in here. Really, uh, 85 Buick Riviera. And I'd never seen one of those cars before. I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I knew that it, you know, it's got an air conditioner on it. Well, they were checking to see if the air conditioner is going to work. They said, hey, can you check the air conditioner on our Buick? And I said, sure. So we opened the hood, and I looked down at the compressor. I said, Jerry, go in there and turn on the air conditioner. So Jerry goes, and he sits in the car for a while. He's looking around. I'm thinking, how long does it take to turn on an air conditioner? You ever seen somebody take a 30-second job and make it last four minutes, you know, this kind of thing? So he says, I says, what's wrong, Jerry? He said, I don't guess I know how to turn the air conditioner on this car. I said, oh, come on. So I go in there, and I sat down, and I looked around, just like he did. <laughs> but what it was, it had a little TV screen in the middle of the dash, and that does everything. You select what system you want to do. It's a touch screen. And this was in 85. In 85. It was a little CRT, like a television, a little touch screen. And you could control your radio and your air conditioner or whatever you picked. Well, you had to select the air conditioning, and then you had to turn it on with that by touching on that touch screen and all that. And that's why it was so hard to turn on. But Touch screen in 85. Yeah. In 85. Had, you can look that up. If you ever Google that. Riviera touchscreen, 1985, right in the middle of the dash. There was nothing anywhere on the dash except that touchscreen, and that did everything you needed to do. And there's vehicles like that now, but who would expect that in 85? You know, GM was ahead of the curve on that, pretty much. However, a lot of people had to have those little touchscreens replaced because they tended to give trouble. But it was a little... Now, it wasn't what you're thinking. It wasn't a flat panel. It was a CRT. It was curved. But it had it was a touchscreen. And where whatever you touched, it would know where you touched it. Um, all right, so now let me see here. Let me go on down here. Oh, what I started to say was, you turn on the air comp- compressor, you see it to begin with, is it coming on? You think about your ambient temperature. If it's cold outside, it's probably going to short cycle anyway. If it's hot outside, it ought to come on and stay on a while. You're gonna, you can make it short cycle, though. If you've got one that sometimes is cooling and sometimes it ain't, 
If you close the doors, turn it on max AC, put your fan on low, you're going to make it where it'll cycle off and on. And if you make it where it'll cycle off and on, in a minute, you're going to hear it cycle off and stay off if it's an intermittent cooling thing. And sometimes those little switches, like I told you about, those little switches will have a contact centimeter corroded. If you put your finger on them switches, you hold, you hold it, you'll hear it go click, click every time it switches out and in. If you hear it click and the compressor don't kick on, then you need to see if there's power going through it. Also, what I, what I had never talked about up until now, on your compressor, the air gap on the compressor between the hub and the pulley, there's shims in between there on most of them. Some of them on the GM at GMC, there's a, it actually has a press fit, and you've got to press it on there, and you set your air gap by where you stop pressing it to. But uh, and there's a special, there's a hundred dollar tool for that that I got in there. That's for that purpose, and I need to show you guys how to do that too. On the Chryslers and on the uh, and, and on the uh, forge and stuff, you screw the bolt out, you pull the hub off. It's got splines on it, and the little uh, down in there in the spline hole, you're gonna see some shims. They got different thicknesses of shims. You slide it back on, you torque it down, you measure the um, you know the gap, the air gap. And if the air gap is a little bit too wide. It'll get to the point whenever it's hot where it won't pull in. Now, here, how do you do that? You're going to take a screwdriver handle if you can, and sometimes it's hard to get to. Let's say that it's been cooling just fine, but in the, you know after they drive it a while, it just quits cooling. You let it cycle on and off until it cycles off and don't come back on, and then you take your screwdriver handle and you whack the compressor. I mean, I'm talking about the clutch, and if you whack it with that screwdriver handle and it goes click, and it starts cooling, it says, whoop, need an air gap set. Easy as dirt. Now, sometimes setting the air gap's a little harder than it is on some than others. But the fact is, that air gap is something you're going to see a heck of a lot. You're going to see an air gap a lot. So you need to kind of understand what you're looking at. Just don't be a dummy and go in there and try to charge it up with a bunch of refrigerant and all that kind of stuff when you've got an air gap problem. If it's an intermittent thing, uh, make sure these switches are clicking and all that kind of stuff. If you've got power and ground going to that compressor and somebody hadn't crammed a test light in there and spread a terminal so it ain't touching, but the compressor is not coming on, to suspect the air gap. A lot of times you can look at it and tell the gap's too wide. Sometimes you can't. Just always remember that. I'm telling you this stuff while I'm thinking about it because you're in here to learn heating and AC, right? That's why I'm doing it. I'm not just trying to hold the floor. All right. All right, so now we got um, two technicians are discussing an AC problem. Overcharge your refrigerator. We've already been there. Most AC systems cycle a compressor clutch in regular interval, intervals to control what? What are they controlling when they cycle it? What did I tell you all ago? This is a Monday and everybody's a bunch of deadheads. What did I tell you earlier? Why is it cycling the compressor? This little switch up here. What's that little switch up there on the low side doing? It wants to keep the evaporator from freezing up. Bingo. Evaporator temperature. In a non-cycling clutch system, evaporator freeze up is, present, is prevented by controlling what? Evaporator pressure. Yeah, it's going to be evaporator pressure. See. Now, some of them, and let me tell you this, some of them have got a little temperature sensor, and a lot of them really have got, I say some of them. Uh, foreign cars tend to favor this. They have an evaporator temperature sensor that's just kind of, it's like a little, little thermistor thing. It'll be shoved up in the evaporator fins, and it's hooked up to a little controller. You know, that's sort of like a little electronic controller. And that little electronic controller will cycle off the AC. Now, I told you guys about this dadgum uh, uh, Geo Tracker that came in here. I never seen a Geo Tracker before. I mean, I worked at a Ford dealership. You know what you know. Comes in, a girl says, this is weird. Now, you listen to it. This is a weird story, and you're probably not going to forget this, but it's weird, and I cannot explain how, why or how this happened. She comes in here, and she says, my air conditioner worked up until, you know, it worked all last year. And we went through winter, and now that spring is getting here, it doesn't work anymore. Well, that's not too terribly weird, is it? And so I get in there, and I, you know, what the controls that are there, you know, you click it over on, you know, you turn on the fan, you click it over on your, uh, blow it in your face, you know, the little ISO symbol that shows a person sitting in the seat with the air blowing in the face. Okay, so I turn that thing on, and I, and I don't feel any cold air, so I get out there. And it, it's got it's got all of this everything it needs for air conditioning as far as the refrigerant. Now it was a blend, but we didn't you know really at the time I didn't have any way to pull it out. But it had plenty of refrigerant in it. It was just like it was part part twelve and part one thirty four. That won't keep it from cooling. It's dangerous. You don't go suck it into your machine, right? 
So I'm checking all this stuff out. I can kick the AC on and make it run. Well, what I found out was, you know the little blue, the little button that you pushed, it's got a blue light on it that says AC on it? Right. This one had a place for it, but there was no button there. And there never had been. The wires were just laying there stiff like they had been when the car was built. Now, how did her air conditioner ever work? I said, has anybody worked on this thing or replaced part of the dash or anything? She said, no. It's, nobody's done anything like that to it. But they, right there where the button was supposed to be, there was a little blind plug. Like you would see that you'd have to break out to put the button in there. And the button was $70. And she didn't want a button. But I said, this is ridiculous. So what I did was, since she didn't want a button, I just jumpered that little wire that was supposed to plug into the button so that any time she turned it on, the compressor would run and she could actually regulate the heat with temperature with temperature control. But that was just the strangest thing I've ever seen. How did it ever work? You know? I mean, I actually wrote an article about that. It's a geo tracker. It was an unsolved mystery. I never figured out what in the sound hill was going on there. Why was there a place for a button but no button? Why had there never... You can look at a connector. No button had ever been plugged into it since that thing was brand new. Figure that out. Riddle me that. Two technicians are discussing vehicle uh, variable, excuse me, variable displacement compressors. Technician A says they're designed to control evaporator temperature. Technician B says they're designed to control evaporator pressure. Uh, who's correct about that? Both of those guys are right. You know what a variable displacement compressor is? <coughs> all right. Now, we haven't torn any compressors. We've torn compressors apart. We've torn some apart in here, haven't we? Didn't you all? A, a scroll compressor we tore apart. Now, the swash plate on the compressor is like laying in here at an angle. And as it turns, the pistons go back and forth, right, just because of that swash plate. Okay, and I can show you, you know, diagrams of this. What if you could change the angle of that swash plate? So that the pistons weren't moving anymore. They were spinning. You know, the compressor was spinning, but the pistons weren't going back and forth. They were just staying in the same place. Wouldn't that control that? So they're using refrigerant pressure and a solenoid to control the angle of that swash plate. Think about that. And you know what? These don't have a clutch. So it's just they got a pulley. But they don't have a clutch. It's operated off that, that plate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, anytime they want to stop. But on those clutches, you'll have a little breakaway apart somewhere. In case something locks up or the pressure goes too high, it'll break loose. And, a, and it'll be spinning, but the compressor won't be turning. But the compressor, it's a clutchless compressor, and it turns all the time. Now, you'll see that sooner or later. Something else is weird. On some of the forwards, you've got a belt with no tensioner. Hmm. It's a stretchy belt. And the way that you get it off is you take something like a canvas strap and you got to, you know, turn the engine until you roll it up under the belt mm -hmm. and you grab that strap and, you know, put it on the inside and roll the belt off. And you got to have a special tool to stretch it back on there. <laughs> I mean, that's, but I mean, I just want to tell you in case you run into that, some of them don't have a tensioner. You may not ever hear that anywhere else, but that's the way that this one of them are built. I mean, you, I mean, sooner or later you'll run into it if you're a wrench twisting person. Ain't that right? You're going to have that. Ask uh, uh, him, ask um, Michael, when you go over, have you seen ever? Have you seen any of these new Fords that don't have a tensioner? They've just got a stretchy rubber belt. You know, he's probably seen it because he's seen just about everything, you know. All right. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, he has. He's seen a lot. I, I wasn't making fun of him. All right. What are you doing? All right. Okay. Y'all are doing like Brandon. Look at that. Brandon's over laughing again. We laughing at Brandon. It was funny. I love it, Wes. Oh, he's laughing yeah. at Wes. Okay. All right. All right, we're going we're gonna to zip on through this. We're going to get through this. Right Let's make it happen. Okay. Uh, huh? 12 is D. Yeah, 12 is D. No, let's see. Uh, automotive AC compressor is scroll, reciprocating piston, rotary vane. Rotary vane? That's interesting, isn't it? What's a rotary vane do? We'll talk about that later. Two technicians are discussing the lines used to connect AC components. Technician A says they're usually rubber hoses with metal ends. Right? Usually. Not every time, but usually. That's why he said usually. Right? Rubber. Uh, with, huh? Anybody? In? Okay. Um, technician B says metal tubing is often used. Okay. Yeah, that's both of them. A starved evaporator is one that has low pressure but too warm temperature. And what's that going to be due to? Is that going to be restricted airflow over the evaporator? Too low of a refrigerant charge? Too high of a refrigerant charge? Or what? Too low? 14 is going to be BS too low of a refrigerant charge. It's not getting enough refrigerant. 
Desiccant is placed in a receiver dryer or accumulator dryer to do what? A, absorb moisture. That's what I always want desiccant's there for. Go for That's the same thing you put in like a, a bag of beef jerky. That little thing in your bottle of pills, yeah. you know, it's got desiccant, do not eat, and this kind of stuff. Yeah. You ever wanted to eat that to see what it do to you? What would it do no, to never, you? Huh? What would it do to you? Uh, I'm not sure. I never ate it, but uh, there's a reason why they say don't eat it. What probably, did they say it'll do to you? I don't know. Probably make you, it'll probably absorb all the moisture and you would just dry up. I don't know. <laughs> All right, then. All right, uh, let's see. The refrigerant enters the evaporator as what? Uh, a vapor. Low pressurized vapor. No, uh, well, a low pressure atomized liquid. It enters it as an, as an atomized liquid. What does atomized mean? That means it's pss, sprayed out like you know, like a spray, like oh, a mist, okay. and all that. Like a spray, yeah. spray, spray yeah. paint can? Yeah, like whenever you're spraying anything out of a paint, it's just be a mist that's atomized. Um, the receiver dryer accumulator is placed in a system. Why? That's number 17. As a storage tank for the refrigerant. And there's some oil mixed in there too, okay? You got that? Which system uses a receiver dryer? What I tell you? No, no, no. The. Variable displacement thermal expansion valve system. Very good. Variable displacement thermostatic expansion valve system. Uh, refrigerant entering the condenser should be what? Should be high pressure. Uh, high pressure, that's vapor. right. What's the last part? Vapor. vapor. High pressure vapor. Oh, it is a vapor. It is a vapor. What? Because remember, it's got to go in there as a vapor so it can turn into a liquid. Gotcha. It's got to condense, right? Think about it. Got to rewire those synapses so they'll fire the right way for you guys, right? Okay, what are the states of the refrigerant and the accumulator? Vapor, liquid, both A and B, neither A and B. That's both of them. All right. Now let's see how fast we can whip through these last few questions here. Ooh, we have a picture. Cool. Neat up. All right. Number 21. Modern, or, modern automotive refrigerant systems can be all of the following except... Actually, that's going to be D because that can be any of those, right? What type of refrigeration system is shown in this illustration? What type of refrigerant system is shown in this illustration? Uh, D. What do you see in there? That's number 22. That is actually an A. Don't you see the orifice tube? Yeah. Don't you see that the evaporator has got an accumulator between the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, there you go. And this has got a picture of that, what's inside the accumulator. Okay, some hybrid vehicles use a blank compressor to keep the AC system operating in cases where the engine is off. That's number 23. Either B or C. You know, most, a lot of your hybrids, not most of them, a lot of your hybrids have got electric compressors that's got like 200 and something volts going to them. And they just, that's all that runs them is the, is the hybrid, the voltage. Okay, choose the, oh, wow, wow. I'll tell you what, tell you what. Um, that right there, wow, <laughs> son of a gun. That is gonna, that's going to be a while, isn't it? Okay, let's make this happen right quick. Okay, what is A? That is condenser. Huh? That's condenser. Wait a minute. A is the condenser. A is the condenser. Got it? Yeah, J. All right. Somebody tell me what B is. Liquid line. B is a liquid line? Oh, no, 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 no. I was just reading that. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, just, I mean, let's look at them real quick. What That's is B? That's that uh, little switch thing you were talking about. That is the charge port, isn't it? Yeah. All right. There's one on both sides. Yeah. And there, D is the charge port. And C. Oh, oh, whoa. B, yeah. I, don't, I don't see charge. <laughs> I don't need service port high or so. They, are they calling oh, those? Call well, them. service ports, what are they going to call them? It's going to be the high side. Right? Yeah. I mean, the high side service port is going to be D. The low side service port is going to be B. You got that? Wait. Okay. See that? Obviously, you know what the compressor is. All right, between the compressor and the evaporator is what? I'm sorry, excuse me, between the compressor and the compressor and the condenser, the big item at the top is the condenser. Between the compressor and the condenser, you've got liquid line. Got that? Yeah. Does anybody see an accumulator on there? 
What kind of system is this? I don't know. Huh? What kind of system is it? Uh, hmm? What is that? L. Notice between the the expansion valve is F. You see F? You see the expansion valve? Right down there on the evaporator. They drew the expansion valve and it's one of these kind. Got it? That's the expansion valve. Because of the fact it's got an expansion valve, you know that can is a receiver dryer, not an accumulator. Receiver dryer is always in the liquid line. That got them all? Is there any we missed? Do we have a suction line coming from the evaporator to the compressor? We do, don't we? Let's see. You got it? What do you think about that? Fantastic. Huh? Fantastic. Everybody happy? No. What do you what do you lack? All of it. <laughs> uh, the line that comes off the compressor going to the evaporator is the uh, The line that comes off the compressor line. it doesn't go to the evaporator, it comes from the evaporator. You gotta think about which way refrigerant flowing. Refrigerant goes from the compressor to the condenser to the evaporator and then back to the compressor. So would it be the liquid line? Uh, the one that's going, no, it's the suction line. The suction line is the big cold one that comes from the evaporator down to the compressor. If you got it fully charged and it's working right, that line will be cold all the way to the compressor. <coughs> got that? And that would be this line right here. The one from the compressor. And actually, the refrigerant is flowing up here, goes through there to the compressor, goes around through the discharge line to the condenser, through the receiver dryer, and all that. So you got your charge ports, you know. Charge ports are here. Are you missing any of those? Anybody still missing any? I've told you enough to where you ought to be able to answer these off the top of your head. H is the liquid line, right? Yeah, H is going to be your liquid line. Component H is the liquid line. That makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah, because they're all numbered... A, a B, it's so pretty stupid the way they did that, isn't it? I mean, they should have just actually, they should have done this a different way, but I mean, it's, it's confusing the way that the thing is written up. Component A, you know. 32K. I'll tell you what, I would have done that a different way. I need to, I need to edit this test here. This is ridiculous. Uh, K oh. is the high pressure relief valve, uh, right? Pressure sensor. Pressure sensor? Mm-hmm. It's not a relief valve. That's going to be on the compressor. Look, M is the high-pressure relief valve. And what happens, the high-pressure relief valve, when the condenser fan doesn't come on, mm -hmm. that high-pressure relief valve scares the daylights out of you. What you'll hear, if that high-pressure relief valve, it's, got, it's made to pop at like 500 pounds or something. If that thing pops, it'll go, Bleh! make a big noise, and there'll be a bunch of steam come out from under the hood. And he said, what the world is that? Somebody said, I hear a big noise, and I see smoke from under the hood. He said, your condenser fan wasn't running, and it was summertime, you was running your AC. That's usually what that is. And uh, and if the, remember now, I told you that way to check the fans to see if they were intermittently, you know? All right, so. Everybody happy with that? Y'all done? Uh-oh, 29 is, uh.